so much for joining us here tonight. Um, my name is Amy Shapiro, and I am the Director of Programming and Engagement here at the Anderson Collection. So the first thing I want to do is just read Stanford's land acknowledgement statement. Stanford sits on the ancestral land of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have a responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. And also want to note that this acknowledgement has been de developed in collaboration with the Moagma Ohlone tribe, largely through Karen Beesman, who is the director of the Native American Cultural Center here at Stanford. So, welcome. It's so wonderful to see so many of you here, and I hope you've all had a chance to see Stephanie's amazing exhibition on your way in. Um, so I'm going to keep this short because nobody likes really long introductions, including myself. So I just want to say a few thank yous. Um, so first, a thank you to Pamela and David Hornick for their generous support of the action. They're not here, but they can hear your claps and in their spirits. Um, so also lenders to the exhibition, the McAvoy family collection, Wendy Norris, Laura Klein and Michael Lazarus, um, and Catherine Clark Gallery. So I know some of those people are here today. Also, I want to mention um, part of us having Stephanie's work here today is also a nod to the AAAI initiative. That would be me saying it twice. Um, Asian American Art Initiative of Cantor, where Stephanie also has a piece um, in Maggie's show at home on stage. So we are delighted that she has the connection here between both museums as well. So now I will introduce our guests. Stephanie Suhuka works in photography, sculpture, and installation, moving from handmade and craft-inspired mediums to digital editing and archive excavations. Recently, she has focused on how photography and image-based processes are implicated in the construction of racialized, exclusionary narratives of history and citizenship. Born in the Philippines, she is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship and has exhibited widely, including the Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum and the San Francisco Museum of Art, among like a million others, particularly right this moment. Um, she is an associate professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and resides in Oakland. And she's also a Stanford alum. She got her MFA here in 2005. Um, Kim Beale is an art historian who specializes in the history of photography. Her book, Good Pictures, A History of Popular Photography, looks at 50 stylistic trends in the medium since the 19th century. Recently, she's written about photography and climate change for The Atlantic, a survey of street views for Cabinet, and a history of screenshots for The Believer. She also writes frequently about modern and contemporary art for Art Forum, Art in America, Bomb, Photograph, Sculpture, and also a million other places. Um, <laughs> That's the thing about introductions at Stanford. It's like they have to be so long because there are so many athletes. So just know that they're both awesome. Um, so, and she's all, she teaches art history here and is the associate director of Italic, which is the arts minded residence based academic program for first year students. So, please welcome Stephanie Seguto and Kim Beal. All right, this is lovely. Um, thank you for coming out. Um, oh, did it just shut off? <laughs> Let's see if this one works. Hello? Oh no, let me help. I can also project, but let's, let's stay away from that. <laughs> Do you want to project for like a minute? I guess I could, okay. I, well, one, just thank you. Thanks for coming out. Um, as was mentioned, I'm also a, an alumni of Stanford, so almost 20 years now, which is kind of crazy. Uh, but I'm really happy to be here with Kim because I actually stalked Kim first on Instagram uh, based on Kim's photo book collection, which some of you might also know about and follow. So it's really wonderful to be here because we've actually never met before today. So, um, you know, we've been kind of researching each other's interests and then this opportunity came up to have this conversation. 
So we're really excited to, to have it. Um, I should say that that was a mutual stocking. <laughs> and this works. That's great. Hello. So this is this one? Sorry for the interruption. Great. Thank you. All right. So the way we're going to set up this uh, time period here, I think 45 minutes of discussion and presentation. The images I put together actually are, are of the works in the exhibition. Is this echoing or is it just me? Just me. Okay. So, and then I also put together uh, background images because in a way, you know, when you look at a final artwork, um, sometimes it's difficult to see, you know, what the, either the inspirations were, the research methods behind it. And between the works, we're going to pause and then Kim's also going to interject questions in relationship to it. So we're going to have a, a conversational dialogue, which for me is a real treat because as a professor at UC Berkeley, I'm used to just droning on for an hour or so. And so a discussion period is actually really wonderful. Um, but I just want to start, um, I'll, I'll give a brief um, background about the, the type of work I make. And I like to say that my work recycles, copies, resuscitates, warps, reframes, makes do, rips off, plunders, and hinges on existing forms and historical aesthetics because the past is still unfinished business. And prior to, say, uh, my work in photography, I was more well known for working on large-scale installations. So sometimes these projects, they involve hundreds, even thousands of objects uh, commissioned by institutions and museums and often working with uh, participants to produce and even distribute these things. But the switch to photography, actually, um, I still see it as rooted in sculpture. This is a kind of diagram of what, what types of forms my work takes. Um, I am a sculptor, a sculpture professor, and a lot of my work um, involves um, making things. Um, and then photography came out actually because um, I realized I needed a way to kind of capture the, uh, the forms I was making uh, with a different type of uh, framing and medium. So um, i like to also share this image. Um, this is not my work, but it's a stock photo of a kind of uh, studio setup. And this is a very kind of typical idea of, you know, a backdrop, a set of lights, um, and then all of the kind of things that surround the making of a studio photo. And what I like about this particular um, image is that all the things on the periphery have kind of migrated to the middle. And that's really what I'm interested in, is how a photograph or images are constructed, um, the, the way that they're positioned to say or not say certain things, especially when it comes to issues of, say, racial representation or historical narrative. So we thought we should start by explaining why I, as the historian of photography, am here talking to you, don't identify as a photographer, but as somebody who works with photography as a medium. Um, and I wonder if you could just tell me, I know you've described a little bit about this, but what is it about a self-definition as an artist that helps you make work? Why is it important to think about what you call yourself as an artist? Well, I think because the history of um, art an art school is so divided, you know, so I went to a sculpture program. If I were to start working in photography, that's a whole set of skills, histories, and very, very specific techniques that usually you just can't walk into. And so I'm very mindful, actually, that, you know, I learned um, the sort of craft of photography pretty much on my own. And it was because I was starting to create works that really lent themselves to um, image making. But uh, I guess this is a good place to start, maybe, because it also has references to historical ethnographic photographs. So as was mentioned, you know, my family comes from the Philippines. I was born in the, in the Philippines. And a lot of the images that I've had a chance to view, especially taken through a kind of American or Spanish colonial lens, were ethnographic images of Filipinos. And the folks were posed. They were also you know, kind of um, uh, showed as a kind of uh, uh, definitive uh, type of, of people. Uh, but when I was making this particular work, uh, this is from a series called Cargo Cults, um, and they're studio portraits using mass manufactured goods 
purchased from and returned to the Gap, Banana Republic, Forever 21, Charlotte Russe, H&M, American Apparel, Urban Outfitters, Target, Radio Shack, and others. And so, you know, this was done in 2013, I guess 10 years ago now, which, you know, feels like a long time, but when I was making the work, um, it was so much about these objects and styling myself and creating this kind of fictional ethnographic type. Um, but then in order to capture that, you know, a photograph had to have been made. So that's, this is really the bridge. This is actually the first photo series I, I ever worked on. And so when you're making this work, you describe being kind of self-taught in photography. Were you reading books or looking online? And what kinds of um, instructional <laughs> materials were you discovering? Um, and when did you start recognizing that the instructional materials were themselves biased? Yeah, so you, you'll notice like on this, there's a, it's kind of, for me, a generic type of ethnographic image. There's nothing authentic about these. They're sort of amalgamations. You know, they're creative fictions based on, you know, lots of images that are in circulation. Um, on the sides of each image, too, there's usually a kind of um, grayscale, uh, like a color bar that's uh, affixed onto it. And what I was noticing when I was looking, especially at historical uh, photo images, um, that there's this kind of uh, calibration chart that the a historical image is photographed with. And that's to kind of make sure that when that image is reproduced, that it, it is reproduced correctly. And so I started incorporating them in these photographs because it was, I felt it was a, this sort of, um, I don't know, like a, a like a, it was a grid, it was a regimented sort of like standard that these images were being held against. Um, but the, the images are also kind of uh, funny, weirdly enough. I mean, there's a certain humor in it, despite the fact that I think it's a critique on ethnographic photography. Like, I can dissect, you know, you can see uh, price tags still attached to the clothing labels. Yeah. Um, in the middle, that's like a gap, um, you know, uh, <coughs> label, because in order for me to buy and return the objects after the photo shoots, I couldn't remove the sales tags. So, you know, on the top of my head is a, a cheerleading pom-pom, and, you know, there's like a, a sock from Target around my um, my arm, and everything is really, you know, it's, it's, there's nothing exotic about where these things come, came from, but to style it in that way, I was looking basically at the just the massive field of ethnographic photography. And where were you seeing those images? Everywhere. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's the thing, right? It's like they, they circulate online, they circulate in history books. There's, there's this kind of, um, uh, uh, kind of look about them. And when you went to those images, were you looking for something in particular? Well, I was actually thinking specifically about um, the Philippines. So even though these are not recognizable as, as Filipino or of the Philippines, the Philippines itself is a very diverse country. It's, it's made up of over 7,000 islands. In many cases, you know, very distinct cultures and peoples were forced together under a kind of colonial empire. So there's not really a very definitive um, Filipino identity. And so I wanted the difference of these to actually reflect some of the differences that I was seeing through these images, or the, the original ethnographic photos. <laughs> okay, so, and like, if we skip forward here, um, who's familiar with this image? Anyone here? Yeah, it's an early color calibration chart. So, you know, it, it's a real object. Like this image circulates, um, it's created by Adobe Systems. Um, it was, I think, started in the 90s, early 90s. And um, you can see this sort of Carmen Miranda-like figure uh, with lots of colorful fruits and things to kind of compare, um, you know, the, the, the range of colors that you're supposed to use. Um, on top of her head, you can even see it spells Adobe, you know, out in, um, in blocks. And I used to work as a graphics and exhibition designer at a museum, and part of my job was to color correct images. And this is the image that they gave me to correct against. Interesting, right? I mean, there's so much packed into this image. It's pulling from, you know, a, a kind of pantomiming, 
of an ethnic fiction. It also, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot going on. Tim, what do you think? Can you say a little bit about what color correction is? We were talking earlier about how um, analog processes are kind of unfamiliar to people today. So what does it take to make a print that looks like what you think it's going to look like? Well, I mean, it makes sense, right, that because of the way, the different ways of color reproduction that we have, we have different digital screens, we have different ways of printing, you know, photographs or even cheap laser jet prints, all these different methods. Um, the color calibration charts really came up as a way to try to standardize and match against, you know, a, a quote unquote true color. Um, when I think about that system though, uh, it's deeply embedded in how the formation of photography and film was a highly racialized science. I mean, the early, um, early film photography was not made, uh, it was optimized for white skin. And everything else would kind of fall into a, 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 a did more difficult uh, area to register. So, you know, if you think about how that's affected the way that we see images, um, it's almost unquantifiable, actually. You know, it's difficult to describe how that um, affects what we see. And then I love these calibration charts because they also show a kind of normative, you know, kind of thing about what's correct, right? So not only the colors, but everything from, like, say, a heterosexual union to issues of affluence and class. Um, I'm just going to scroll through them because they're just great. <laughs> and then I love how random they are too, right? So, I mean, there's nothing, you know, horrible about them. They really are trying to show, you know, different color, uh, colors of skin. Um, but it's very random. It's just kind of all thrown together into these very odd kind of collages of uh, corrections. And of course, there are pictures that, you know, people think of something that's valuable to be pictured. It's like a vacation photo, they're baby photos, they're, these are you know, possibly product shots for a grocery store. Um, and so I think that also tends to normalize what kinds of things can be pictured, um, as well as who can be pictured and actually represented on film. This one's my favorite. <laughs> I know, right? And so, the, you know, these things are, they've, they've been around for a very long time. This one in particular, I think, is this like hyper performativity of ethnic uh, type, where everyone is playing in their range. <laughs> I love it. So before you move on, so this is 1998, and you can see this um, Macbeth color checker chart, um, which isn't just all the possible colors that you could represent, but it's the colors that you might care about representing. So you can see they're you know, adding these you know, possible skin tone values as well as actual spectral values. So maybe that's a good transition to talk about your work that's in the front window that people saw when they came in. Yeah, so you might have noticed um, when you entered the building on the very front uh, on the windows were a series of color blocks. And you know, I wanted it to look kind of like minimalist art, but it literally is a reproduction of the um, the Macbeth color chart. Macbeth, like that. Okay. Macbeth. Yeah. yeah, and so in in the way, it's um, because of the Anderson's collections focus on minimalism. I thought it would be a really nice entry point too. <laughs> but then we also have you know a kind of. Uh, I guess a, a talking back to the color chart. So um, in the hallway is a very large uh, vinyl mural reproduction of one of my prints in which I'm literally crumpling crappy laser jet bad color prints of the color calibration charts and then re-photographing them as high-end uh, photos and printing them. So there's this kind of like loss uh, of um, resolution at some point and then you know an attempt to talk back to it yeah and I see this this happens many times in your work in different ways if you go to the canter you'll also see another crumpled work um, which is a way I've heard you describe it as kind of a way of protecting the subjects from view um, and also like challenging that photograph could you tell us a little bit more about it yeah, so I guess actually manipulating the prints is something that uh, has come up a, a bit more. So 
there's, there's cases in which I crumple things. I also cover images and obscure and collage. And so there's other images. Um, oh, oh, no. Okay, we will get there. But <laughs> hard transition. <laughs> the, well, I just wanted to share too that, you know, when I, when I showed the earlier images of my work, being mostly installation, you know, working with institutions, I made a really hard pivot after 2016. I decided that I really needed to address a kind of American uh, narrative and also the American fallacies associated with, you know, why things are the way they are. And I became really fascinated too with how these notions of um, both conflict uh, and a, a kind of deep-rooted, uh, 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 social and political reality has never been uh, formally addressed and dealt with. So, you know, on one hand, Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, and on the other hand, this this very contemporary need, it seems, to keep reenacting the Civil War. And, you know, I was thinking about these things and also witnessing protests on the street. So I'm a professor at UC Berkeley, and in 2017, a number of right-wing speakers were coming to campus, and these very intense protests and street battles were happening. And people were rising up to, to, to fight back. And it was interesting to think at the time, too, that the news media was covering it in this really, really bizarre way. You know, they were kind of equating both sides as somehow equal. And when I was thinking about making work in response to what I was seeing in both the media and news um, the idea of uh, using this green chroma key uh, came up, which you, you recognize from the backdrop fabric that was in that um, early image. And so chroma key, this bright green color, if you're familiar with digital editing techniques, it's a kind of stand-in color. You're supposed to then, anything you photograph against it, you're, you can then drop out that green and substitute anything you want into that backdrop. And so I was recreating uh, what I would consider the aftermath of protests that I was witnessing and using green chroma key fabric and green chroma key painted objects to rearrange and then photograph with this notion too that you know the, the media representation of what was happening was I think completely overlaid with a different uh, kind of telling you know of the politics behind it. So you know, the, the fact that you can almost put anything you want on top of this um, image of protest and, um, and aftermath uh, was one way I was trying to figure out how to process the images that were coming forward at the time. Yeah, and so you were really processing them both as an experience and as image, and maybe recognizing that the experience was so different than how you saw it represented, right, in the news? Yeah, and you know, the, I guess we talk a lot too about, you know, truths, and, and like fake news. And those are such, um, it's so hard to kind of grapple with because it's, it's, you know, it can be lobbied from both sides. But I do think that there is some truth about, you know, when a system is really racist. <laughs> yeah, and so you're making that clear in many of these pictures too, by, and do you have images of the next week? Oh, yes. So you're making that clear by saying these things that seem like they are part of history, like an unequivocal part of history, are also are, are also fabricated. And yeah, so if uh, the, the chroma key works that we just saw was just the beginning of a larger sculptural installation work in which I was also, again, looking to kind of American historical um, <coughs> Uh, uh, icons, one being you know the reenactment or a kind of theatrical costuming. These are on the left hand commercial sewing patterns that you can buy in which you know um, specific moments of American history are kind of you can relive it by making a costume. And then I was also going to Civil War reenactments in Guerneville, California. <laughs> it's bizarre, isn't it? The Civil War never touched California. And yet, it's a very popular thing every year. Um, and there's this, there was an interesting photo booth actually there, where you know a tin type photographer was taking photographs of participants, you know, from both sides, you know, playing you know their roles in it. Um, and so that's a shot, you know, of uh, of one of the uh, or two folks posing. But 
you know, in this work is not here on display, but in kind of melding these two concerns, I worked on a project called The Visible Invisible, and in which I, I sewed, I hand sewed um, three iconic um, American historical garments, but using the green chroma key backdrop fabric. So it was literally a way to kind of bring that material forward um, and also kind of show, I think, this sort of like really um, embedded uh, kind of manipulable narrative of American history. So if you think about the three garments, you know, the Plymouth Pilgrim, uh, the Antebellum South, which is in the very front, the most opulent kind of, you know, garment, and then the colonial revolution on the right, those are very important, you know, symbols to American history. This notion of two of, you know, kind of like progress or, um, you know, a, a sort of fanciful opulence. And they're also just deliberately chosen moments in American history, which leave out many things. I mean, including the destruction that you see in the background. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the three garments sit together with a, a, a textile printed with one of the chroma key backdrops. And the other thing I wanted to point out too is like, I spent a whole year making these because as an, you know, I, I'm an immigrant to the United States and I, what I really wanted to do with this work is I wanted to have a very kind of physical um, grappling with these historical garments. So to make them from scratch and to make them myself is also to kind of implicate myself maybe in both the, um, the ownership of American history, but also maybe the recrafting of what it can be. Can we talk a little bit about your handmade processes? Um, and it's something that we don't often think of with photographs, especially now we see them on screens so often. But you are involved physically in a lot of your work. So what do you learn from making things with your hands? Well, that's a good question. I think it's, yeah, maybe it is about the, the total fabrication, right? So it's like, if we can also, um, if it's a given that photography is itself a kind of fabrication, right? Like we're posing things, we're choosing what to crop in, what to crop out, what's important, what's not, that, you know, to then go even deeper and handcraft the objects that will be in that image is definitely, you know, this questioning of like, well, you know, how, how much can we be responsible for and then maybe even expose. And I start to see some of that in your pileups also, which we will get to later, uh, but there's a lot of attention to like physicality and to challenging what we think of as um, real in the photograph or what might be a representation of a representation. Yeah, and that's where also this, um, so the, I think the flowers also are an interesting thing because, you know, flowers are a, a, a typical kind of still life genre, um, both in painting and photography. And so um, at a certain point, I was turning my attention to painting flowers. So this is a spray painted uh, uh, tulips uh, with like a hot fluorescent orange spray paint and then rephotographed. And it's actually kind of obvious, like I was thinking about Trump. <laughs> you know, they're white lilies sprayed orange. <laughs> but they're beautiful. And so I, I wanted to play with that too because it's, you know, for folks that don't necessarily see that, you know, on the surface, I did want that kind of slippage, you know, like maybe you don't know what's happening, but that hopefully you can pick apart, you know, the halo of the spray paint. And we should point out that these images are absolutely incredible in person. Just on the other side of the wall, they have in amazing detail. You're, you're a craftsperson in so many ways. Like this is an incredibly technically beautiful work, which makes it even more like challenging, right? When we recognize that it's, it's a symbol of Trump. So you get drawn into the beauty and then you question your, your being seduced by it. Yeah, and I mean, even with this one too. So the titles are kind of important, right? So this is White Out. Krylon, Color Master, Gloss White on White Oriental Lilies. So it's like white on white. Uh, and this is Black Out. Krylon, Color Master, Gloss Black on White Oriental Lilies, sprayed gloss white. So um, there's a lot of, yeah, if you go up and look closely at the photographs in real life, they're, they're actually quite, kind of grotesque looking. Can, can you go back to the previous image so we can talk about the background? Um, for folks who don't 
recognize what that background represents? What, what is it? Yeah, so the, this kind of gray and white color uh, or checkerboard pattern, um, it's a, it's the, for those that are uh, familiar with digital editing techniques, it's the kind of very, very back layer that you're not supposed to see. I, I call it the Photoshop transparency layer. It's, it's meant to show you that there's nothing left, like there's nothing behind that layer. And yet, interestingly, just like the chroma key green, it's so visible. Right, so it's this notion like don't look at it, you know, <laughs> but there it is, um, and so it, it pops up a lot actually in different installations. And in this case, I digitally printed it on a sheer piece of fabric and then hung the fabric behind, so you can see that it's not a perfect grid, that it sort of has a materiality to it as well. And this is one of those things I think that you know, identifying first as a sculptor and coming to photography, you see how weird these things are that are supposed to be natural, just like what color we think is natural. Um, these tools within photography are also designed. Yeah, and then also thinking too about if everything was so polarized in the previous images, these are now neutral orchids. So these have been, these are living orchids that were sprayed with uh, neutral gray primer paint. And so you, um, you sort of spray this color onto something in order to remove all the color, and then you're supposed to add color on top of it afterwards. But by literally removing all the, um, the color of the orchids, I was also thinking too, again, back to this notion of a kind of like exotic or emphasized other. You know, that orchids are sort of these stand-ins for this very, like a high-end designer object. Um, they're also seen as kind of being very orientalized. And so what would it mean to kind of like try to deny that in some way? And invariably what happens though is you kill the plant. So, you know, this is, um, it took them a while to die. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, they, they were spray painted and then photographed on a neutral gray backdrop. Do you have any feelings about killing the plants? I know you also work with plants. You use natural dyes and you do a lot of gardening. Like, what is your relationship with some of the materials? Yeah, you know, I kind of, I didn't struggle that much. Okay. <laughs> and I think it's because, I, you know, again, um, we accidentally kill plants all the time. Um, I, I, I don't know, maybe I did like six of them or seven. So it wasn't this rampant, you know, killing the plants. But also, I got these at Trader Joe's. I mean, you know, they're, they're a ubiquitous type of plant, and they're actually grown in laboratories, they're cloned, you know, there's nothing special or exotic about these. They're, they're literally, you know, so ubiquitous that they're almost like, well, they're a commodity. So let's maybe think about other objects that you have in your studio, because so many of these projects involve many, many things um, that sometimes then recur. So what's the process of having all these things around you, and how, how does that work creatively? Uh, well, they wind up, you mean like for um, the photo shoots, I guess? Or yeah, what do you save after a photo shoot? Um, oh, not much. much. Really? Well, the good news, that's the other great thing about photography you could get rid of the stuff. And so as a sculptor, I mean, imagine those installations, right? That's crazy. And so thankfully, you know, to, to be able to create these setups, freeze a moment, you know, have the objects there in the, in the way that I want to present it, and then not have to commit to their storage is amazing. Yeah. Photography is great. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I guess uh, back to this, uh, uh, this work, which is in the hallway at the end, um, it's kind of involved, or it's attached to research processes that I did in different archives. And I'll just roll into this one. Um, this is uh, called Block Out the Sun. It's a video, and you can preview it um, in the hallway after the, the talk. But it's 40 individual images with an audio track. And what you see, um, well, Actually, I'll start first of where, the, where it, it originated. So it turns out that the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904 was um, one of the first places in which uh, the American uh, public was able to actually look at Filipinos. Um, this was the time during American colonialism in the Philippines, and so 
uh, during the fair, which was this beautiful, opulent, you know, kind of gathering and uh, a real way to kind of showcase American progress, they also created um, uh, human zoos. And so human zoos were a kind of ethnographic um, presentation. In this case, the Philippine village was built in St. Louis in 1904 at the fair, and over 1,200 Filipinos were imported in to then uh, uh, perform in these sorts of like uh, uh, fictional and semi-fictional, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, displays. <laughs> And I, I, I have to say, I hate showing ethnographic photos. I really do. I'm only doing this actually just be, to prove a point. This is, a, this is a, a fairly decent one. This is one that is not um, as bad as the ones that you could you can find. But you know, this shows, this is from the Philippine village, you know, the label of the people, the people all standing. And I became interested in seeing these because of how ubiquitous they were. You know, like they're they're part of the historical record. In many cases, they're also um, open source in the sense that you know they're copyright free because of the time period under which you know has elapsed between when the original photo was taken and now. And you know, you can download them at different um, uh, resolutions, and they're part of the kind of you know, the public domain at this point. Um, but they're also because of that, they're ripe for re uh, commodification. And so it turns out that just because something is free out in the world, it can actually be turned back into um, a, an image for sale, especially stock photos. So this is a, a snapshot of the same image as a stock photo, in which you then can buy it in different you know, kinds of resolutions and for different uh, uh, purposes. And so I was really fascinated about how, you know, when these images were taken in, in uh, over 100 years ago, they were commodities. You know, they were they were traded, they were sold, they were put on postcards. There were ways in which you know the people depicted, and also you know white America's ability to kind of like look and and you know create boundaries around an other. Um, it it trafficked in these ideas, and so we're still not removed from them because I can actually argue that I think these are still being trafficked, but just in a, a kind of you know parallel and, and different way. Do you want to stop there for a second? Yeah, so when you're doing research and you're coming to a project like this, where, where do you start? It depends. So on this particular work, it's a mix of hunches, you know, years of kind of accumulated ideas, and then sometimes things just snap together, right? Like you find something that you're like, okay, let's try that, and then hopefully the ball rolls forward. I was lucky enough, though, that even though I'd been thinking about these ideas for a while, I hadn't quite had a, um, a, a kind of home, you know, to, to, uh, to flesh it out and make the work until I was invited by the Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis to do a project. And so I decided that I was going to do research in the um, historical societies there. So this is, this is what it looks like to photograph um, in an archive. And in many cases, too, you're not allowed to bring in a lot of stuff, so your photo shoot setup can't be that complicated. You know, this is just a small tripod. Uh, this is at the Missouri Historical Society, the St. Louis Public Library, and the St. Louis Mercantile Library. And through this process, um, I was looking at hundreds of ethnographic images of, of Filipinos taken at the World's Fair. Um, these are all images that are not in the Philippines, they're literally in St. Louis. And as I was looking at them, I, my first impulse really was um, to just cover them and re-photograph them because as someone looking at them 100 years later, I was trying to figure out how do you talk back to the whole, the entire structure of how these images were taken, and also what it means to look at people who were put on display. You know, you can't remove these images from the archive. They're part of the historical record. The only thing I can do is kind of give them a temporary reprieve from having to perform, you know, in that capacity. And so, you know, I did this over and over, in many cases, you can see the kind of surrounding areas, and you can kind of figure out, you know, like what's happening, or what the context is. So, for viewers who encounter images like this, whether it's online or in museums, is there anything that a viewer can do to redistribute the power, or look away, or add more information? What do you think? 
the viewer should do when they encounter an ethnographic image? That's tricky, right? Because in a way, I understand too that they operate as evidence, right? They, they, to remove ethnographic photography would mean that you're basically saying that, well, this stuff just didn't happen. But I do think that in, in many cases, the context of these things are lost. So one of the problems I was encountering was as a Filipino diasporic you know, person, I would look at these images and I would find them very beautiful because they are, you know, sometimes what people were wearing, you know, the, um, the kind of traditions being shown, that's one way that I was learning, you know, about, say, my cultural history, except if you dig deeper and you realize that this was a complete staging, you know, under a kind of colonial, um, you know, overlay, then that's usually what gets lost. So it's hard to attach all that to images. You know, they, they just float now on the internet which is a tie back to the cargo cults images, which really reveals that kind of staging by leaving the tags on and making all the scenes visible. Yeah, exactly, yeah. They, they weirdly, I think, go hand in hand, right? Um, okay, so actually I'm gonna dive into, I, in 2019 I was invited to be, uh, or sorry, I applied to be a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellow. And this is a really wonderful opportunity where as an artist you can get access to archives, you pitch a project, you get a sponsor, and I decided that I wanted to work with the National Museum of American History. Um, and so right before COVID, I spent a lot of time in the museum. I also looked a lot at how the displays kind of constructed, you know, how, how we were supposed to view American history. So when I see something like this, I'm always like, you know, the nation we build together. I'm like, who's we? You know, who's together? How, you know, how are we kind of constructing these things? And again, I spent about two months in this particular archive calling forward files and just shooting. Just, I didn't know yet what I was going to do, but I was trying to search for evidence of the Philippines in the American archive because I wanted to know what the empire saw of its colony, right? Like, what is, what is in there? Um, and it turns out that, you know, a lot of the things, uh, this is a, a kind of snapshot of the database, the online database. A lot of the, the images and documents relate to military history. I mean, that's kind of obvious just because of that initial relationship. Um, and there's also a lot of kind of extractive uh, things. So um, botanical specimens that were collected during colonial, um, you know, forays, uh, pieces of animals, uh, but what I found from going through these archives, I became really fascinated with what was not seen or what was difficult to see. So this is an, uh, just an example of, it's not from the Philippines, but it is a slide that says Better America. And it's so scratched up that you can't really tell what's happening in there. And I was thinking about this sort of degradation of history, how at, over time things just kind of you know, fall apart and disintegrate and thinking about that loss, but also thinking about the possibility, right? So what happens when we can't see clearly in the archive? Can we, can we maybe add something to it? Um, but this is a, a nice uh, shot of process. So when I'm shooting in an archive, I just, I take thousands of photos. I just shoot as much as possible because I'm not quite sure yet what I'm gonna do with it. And I wind up amassing, you know, a kind of really uh, nice research collection but through doing this process, I was realizing that I was actually interested in this kind of pileup of stuff. And so in the galleries here, you can see the result of some of that research work, where I was trying to mimic the archive itself through a kind of photographic collage technique, cutting and pasting images so that they overlapped and uh, cropped other images by covering them. You know, it's, it's like sifting through the archive, and in the end, what I thinking of is you see a lot of stuff, but it's kind of unclear like what you're seeing. Yeah, we're so used to photographs promising evidence and telling us that they, you know, they know that it was made in a certain place and it's definitely a thing that existed, but sometimes without text, we don't know what those things are. And so I've heard you describe this project and, and others as sometimes searching for absences or mistakes in the archive. Um, and some of the ways that happens is visual, like the limits of the image itself, but other times it's, it's a lack of information um, that's attached to the image. Can you tell us about this one? 
Sure. So I think the funniest thing about going through these archives, it's both tragic and funny, actually. Uh, the American Archive, or the American Museum of, uh, of uh, History, doesn't seem to recognize the Philippines very well, um, despite having been a kind of colonial power for over half a century. Um, I found this wonderful, well, this was an anthropology, actually, but there's this wonderful shot, the detail on the right. It says, Portrait of Man, 1900. Uh, and on the very side, you can kind of see written inscriptions as Philippines? Question mark. That is the national hero of the Philippines, Jose Rizal, who is like this really big political figure, like national, like, you know, and they didn't know what to do with him. And he, so he sits in the, in the anthropology archive as just this generic man. And you know he's wearing um, his. Uh, he was he was educated in Europe, and so I think you know the the clothes he's wearing is uh, uh, from his time there too. So it's very odd. It's a very strange thing. Yeah, there's so much um, individual knowledge, and there's so many different departments that work in a museum or a history museum, especially. Um, and so just simply cataloging. Um, where you think that this knowledge should be wide-ranging is, in fact, limited to a single person sometimes. And actually, I noticed something interesting about that picture. Could you go back to it one more time? It kind of looks to me like he's cut out of his background, too, and that's like a neutral um, transparency background, which would have been made by hand oh. in the early 20th century. Because you can see that there's something in the background that does not extend beyond him. So they've, they've put him on one of your transparency grids. He's been vignetted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, the, um, and resolution is interesting too. So when we think about like low resolution image or high resolution images, low resolution images are sort of um, uh, seen as being like not good enough. But when you work in an archive, that's, that's a lot of what you get. You get a lot of things that are like bad reproductions or crappy photocopies of an original. And so instead of uh, denying those, I actually incorporated a lot of them. So if you look at the actual works in the galleries, you'll see a lot of very pixelated or low resolution things. Um, in particular, you know, the image on the right, I was fascinated by because, so it's a digital image of a photograph of a microfilm of a analog photo stereo card so it's, it's been pulled through like all these different you know types of photographic uh, reproduction uh, techniques and in the end you don't really know what you're seeing um, the reality of it it's a it's a, a, a Philippine resistance fighter who was killed by American forces um, but at the same time weirdly showing it in such a vague kind of space you know might be a metaphor too of how that um, that kind of forgetting, you know, of American history in, in what happened there is, is actually in that weird little image. Yeah, again, it's a promise of a document um, that doesn't really give you any information. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to move through these pretty quickly, actually, because they're just details of um, the works. And I really hope that uh, you see them in person. But oh, let's stop here, though, just because look at that beautiful color calibration chart next to the brass bells, which are actually almost as big as the brass bells. So when, when objects are shot in a museum archive, they're usually shot, again, with the, with the chart, but they're almost like competing, you know, for the stage there. And I, I've heard you describe that the chart here becomes an art object in itself, but, you know, as they're competing for the stage, which I think is a, a brilliant thing for it to become because it teaches us to look at those photographs as constructed. Well, the funny thing, too, about this particular calibration chart, it's called the X-Rite Passport chart, which I think is so great, a passport, like this notion, too, that, you know, you can, uh, it gets you places, or you travel with it, or it, it grants you entry. Um, but, yeah, I'm going to, uh, other ways that this work is manifested is in large-scale platform installations where prints are kind of piled on top of each other as well. And again, it's you know me coming back to the sculptural realm, and because these are not like high-end frame photographs, these are sort of cheaper poster prints that are laid out in a kind of way that doesn't really tell a full story, but hopefully uh, the viewer can kind of sift through it and even try to make connections where you know it might not be obvious. And then lastly, I think this is the last piece. Um, 
Rogue States hangs in the very, very front. Um, it looks, well, it's 22 digitally printed fabric flags, and it was originally commissioned for the Moscow Museum of Modern Art in Russia uh, before, um, you know, in 2018. Uh, and what you see, well, it looks like a kind of United Nations, you know, collection of, uh, of, of countries that have sort of come together, maybe in a kind of international unifying way. But if you look at the, um, the, the graphic attached to it, you start to realize that the flags are fictional flags of enemy countries from American Hollywood and European movies in which they had to make up a fake enemy country. Does that make sense? So it's called Rogue States, and the, 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 um, the films that they're from uh, range from Casino Royale, Die Hard 2, Indiana Jones, uh, Ace Ventura, The Interpreter, etc., etc. And by, by making these flags and showing them in this way and calling it Rogue States, I was actually really asking, you know, this is, I did this also at the kind of height of a kind of anti-immigrant xenophobia in the United States, in which remember all the countries that were put on lists uh, as, as being either dangerous or unwanted in the U.S. And my question really was, well, who's really the rogue state? You know, and because America, at, or a kind of, you know, Western view at, at foreignness or otherness is actually also, a, uh, has a lot to do with a kind of uh, amplification and fictionalization. Yeah, and quite literally producing it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to end here, which I love ending with this real photograph. This is taken, this is from 1979. It's me and my mother, uh, two years after we immigrated from the Philippines to the U.S. It's at Disneyland, <laughs> Frontierland. Remember Frontierland, where you go and it's the Wild West? And so we, we dressed up like uh, westward uh, traveling immigrants. Uh, in fake 19th century outfits and posed for this shot. And I, I love coming back to this because it's also thinking too about, you know, I guess maybe my own invention or, or what it means to have been, you know, a new, to have been a new immigrant to the U.S. and trying to find one's place in it. So my mom here was, I was four and she was 22. And so I'm, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll stop here. Great, thank you so much, Seth. So we can take um, some questions from the audience. We have about 10 minutes. Um, feel free to raise your hand and I'll invite you to speak, please. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. You know, this like comment about, you know, um, the reenactments of Civil War in California and how I think you were implying that that was sort of absurd because California wasn't involved in the Civil War. But actually California was involved in the Civil War. 500 soldiers approximately died. The South and the North both wanted California. And uh, Alcatraz was actually, prior to becoming a federal prison, a place where captured Confederate soldiers were um, housed, and, and there just there's actually lots. California was involved in the Civil War, so my question is, um, which I actually did know, and I grew up in the South, and I didn't know that until about five years ago. So, does it change the meaning of reenactors, Cal California reenactors of the Civil War? Do what are they reenacting? <laughs> Do they know the truth? And how does it change how we view them reenacting the Civil War? Great point. Thank you. <laughs> no, no. Actually, I really appreciate hearing that because I was told when I was even there by by the uh, by the folks participating, they were like, "Oh yeah, no, we we See, know. They yeah. don't know." Yeah. <laughs> No, and so, but you're right. Every state was wrapped up in the Civil War. I do think, though, that Californians in particular, or states that weren't kind of um, 
explicitly having battles there have a tendency to find to, to try to remove themselves from yes. being implicated. Yes. And I think that's the problem that's actually. The problem. Yeah. yeah. So the the things they were reenact the battles they were reenacting though were the primary ones. So they they you know it was like displacing Gettysburg into yeah. Kernsville. Yeah. Yeah. Th thank you for sharing that. I guess my only thought is I don't want to I wouldn't want to be a history professor right now. The the idea of what history is or how we look back and at the same time not really knowing knowing thinking about history from from now versus thinking about it 40 years ago say it's it's just gone through so much and i mean i i can't imagine the struggle that people are going through to, to look at it right i mean if you go through archives and each photo is kind of questionable Right. That can be liberating, though, for those that didn't find themselves in the original narrative, right? So I think it's positioned, in, or it, there's a positionality about it, because as, as much as I was disappointed by not finding what I thought I was looking for in the archive, I found lots of other things, and I, I realized that it has cracks and fragments, and, you know, it, it, and maybe that has the potential uh, for re-narration? I, I don't yet know what the word is for it, right? But I, I appreciate you sharing that. I don't think about 50 years from now. How are we going to be looking at things further back in, our, in the own times? I mean, it's just scrolling out. I guess if I could add as an art historian at least, <laughs> um, that I don't think that it's unique to this era that we renegotiate the past um, and that that really is just what history does is that it's a story that we tell about the past and we have a hard time interpreting what the facts of the past are and we've always had a hard time doing that um, that histories the stories we tell about the past have changed you know since for thousands of years so it it feels fresh today, um, but I think I agree that it's an opportunity to tell different stories that weren't told 50 years ago, and that even you know in, at the turn of the 20th century wasn't weren't told about 50 years before that too. So I, I do appreciate it as an opportunity. Yeah, actually, one great example right now is the East of the Pacific exhibition at the Cantor, where. I had never seen representations of Asian and Asian Americans in the 19th century, the way that the, that exhibition was framed. And so that wasn't, you know, I was reading it as, it wasn't making it up. It was literally, you know, creating the right context for those particular stories to be shared, finally. And I, I, it's an amazing show if, no one's, if folks haven't seen it yet. Another hand. Go ahead. So I love that you're ending with this this piece that kind of maybe takes you back to your beginnings. When you were constructing some of the the um, ones where it was you know the reconstructors or the photographs, did you have any of this in mind, or did you find this kind of later on and kind of come back to it? You mean this image? This image, yeah. But I, when I, you're doing the other ones where it's you know the either pulling it from the archives or seeing the reenactors in that similar type of you know photo booth. Well, I, I always had this photo because it was, you know, we took it so long ago and it was just part of the family record. And then when I finally looked at it again, I was like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, it was like, holy, that's like everything. That's, that's bizarre, right? Like total construction of an American identity from day four, right? <laughs> And the, the, the kind of, um, the wishfulness of this image too, like I, find, I found it really hopeful, like, you know, I, I'm kind of angry looking in here, you know, but my mom is like, she wants to sit us as Americans yeah. in this like very historical way. I mean, I don't think she was thinking too hard about it, but you know, it's a, um, it, to me it's come to symbolize a lot. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Where will, where will your investigation of the archive go next? Oh, good question. Actually, um, I'm working on something right now. So I'm 
because of all the archival work I've been doing and taking photos of like thousands of things, it's actually really hard to get in some of these archives. It really is like you have to take time, you have to you know spend um, effort, not usually money, but it's an investment. And I've found that um, a lot of the photographs I'm taking are not going to be digitized anytime soon by the archives and museums themselves because they're not deemed important enough. Literally, right? Archives have limits. Institutions choose what they need to kind of like you know devote to um, to putting out digitally, and so. I'm actually working on right now what I call a rogue finding aid, where I'm working on a, a, a I have all these photos <laughs> that no one else can see, and I make, I'm going to make them available to researchers uh, who are interested in these, in these topics, but don't have the opportunity to, to travel. And so it's kind of a conceptual project, and um, yeah, I, it's extra institutional is what I'm calling it, you know, and I'm hoping to work with other researchers in this way to, so we will collectively amass a sort of publicly, well, publicly with the limits, I think, because a lot of these images actually I don't think should circulate freely. They're very problematic images, and so hopefully it would be to researchers, students, folks that have an investment in the ethics of these images, but still would like access to them. Yes, that is amazing. Great projects. I love the idea of radical librarians and artists. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. I think that's it. Thanks. Everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.